We've got our pop-off later in the show, Greg Cody, the Corn King, against my popcorn. That'll be probably in the post-game. We've got some local hour stuff that I want to do in the next segment. But Ron McGill is with us now. And uh, before we get to stuff with Ron McGill, I don't know because of demographics whether the answers will be different generationally, but Aaron Taylor Johnson has been offered the role of James Bond, evidently. James Bond, uh, one of the most iconic film series you will ever find. 007. Thank you, Stugant. You got it. Uh, a lot of people criticized Daniel Craig, but they warmed up to him. So I ask you, who was the best 007 uh, at Lebetard show? And your choices are going to be uh, Daniel Craig and Sean Connery and Roger Moore and Pierce Brosnan. Uh, who was your choice, Ron McGill, for the best of all the 007s? Uh, definitely Sean Connery. The original was the best. He set the tone. Uh, was he? He was before Roger Moore. Yes. Sean Connery. Yes. He was the original. He was Absolutely. The original. Yeah. Okay. The very first. Right. Okay. So Run up against Odd Job. <laughs> what? With the the razor brim hat. You don't remember Odd Job? Oh. No, I do remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't remember his name. I do remember the hat. Yep. The uh, yes. Hat. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the nemesis of 007 uh, was an Asian man who flung a hat that had like knives on it or blades or whatever. Who a throws razor sharp hat? Brim. <laughs> who like a hat? Like a peaky blinder. Uh, kind of like yeah, one of the, one of those kinds of hats. An amazing <laughs> weapon, though. Yeah. 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 Think about that it. Weapon. Right, if right. you're accurate, yes, it's kind of a. <laughs> one if you're not a deadly fedora <laughs> you have to be very accurate with the hat otherwise you're just throwing a race blade at it somebody yeah uh, i want to play we're going to update some things here with our tournament i think uh, because of billy we did a very poor job of that yesterday it was just a general sprawling mess and i don't know if something like this will have made our tournament of oddities but i just want to play one of the more memorable moments we've had with ron mcgill here where he was talking to someone he thought was a doctor but was oh god was really a, was actually really? adam mckay hold on a second oh, when you tell me sir with all due respect when you come on here and you say you have 69 denial crocodile <laughs> do you understand what that means okay that means that not only are you giving pleasure to the crocodile but the crocodile is giving pleasure to you at least and that is an, okay that is an <laughs> accurate description of what happened this was really a, really uh, a well, 14 I, I foot in this, in, in, this, in this in this country sir that in most states is illegal. It's considered bestiality. I don't know if that made the tournament in any way. I hope it did. Uh, we were just talking before you came on, Ron, about the blue whale's tongue being 2.7 tons, uh, yeah. which I, I simply couldn't believe that something like that could, like, what is a, a mathematical fact that you could give us that would top that one if you were just trying to impress us? The blue whale's tongue weighs 2.7 tons. Well, the trunk of an elephant has over 40,000 individual muscles just in the trunk. Hmm. And how impressive is that as a limb compared to the other limbs that animals have? Is that the most impressive of all the limbs? <laughs> oh, yeah. For me, by far. By far. What do all of those, uh, what do all of those things do? They just are able to move the trunk in so many different ways. You know, the trunk of an elephant can take down a huge tree or it can pick up a dime. I mean, the dexterity of that that limb is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, you seem stunned by that, Greg. Uh, the idea of an elephant trunk picking up a dime is more surprising to me than an elephant knocking over a tree. <laughs> and it's yeah, like... I know, but that's, that, that's the diversity. That's the dexterity of that limb. That's what makes I it so amazing. I've been picking up I, dime actually... pieces since the dawn of time. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I have seen an elephant pick up a dime with its trunk. What's he do with it? Invest it, or does he spend it? Oh, my God. It's usually God. at Hillstone during happy hour. My ah. uh, Ron, <laughs> what's going on with sawfish in, in the Keys? They're, they're acting I I very knew. bizarrely. I wish I knew, Mike. They are dying off, and it's something that's a big red flag. And I hope they can find the cause of this because it is a, you know, it is a protected fish. It's a becoming an endangered fish, and uh, it could be an indicator of a much bigger problem. Yeah, uh, that's what I want to talk to you about because this is an endangered species, as as you outlined. And for those that haven't seen the videos uh, that have been trending locally, and uh, I know newscasts have picked up on it, these sawfish are essentially beaching themselves and acting very erratic, attacking people that are trying to help them. It's a truly bizarre video, and no one knows the root cause of this because they're doing this in mass. Are there any good theories, Ron, that you've heard? 
No, I mean, I've just heard there's some kind of toxin in the water, some kind of something in the air that is, you know, invading and making a neurological issue with these fish, uh, because it seems to be a neurological issue, um, but nobody knows what is causing it. Ron, I saw a video on Instagram um, that said that you can't choke an owl. Is that true? Uh, I don't think that's true. I think if you try to choke an owl, you're going to get taloned to death. Tony, what's what's going on with the hair? I'm sorry. I just joined on. What's what the is... deal with owls? He's uh, he's suffering the punishment of being Jerry Seinfeld uh, today. But, oh, oh, okay. Like, I was just not... trying to figure out what that was because it's scary. Are you, Seinfeld. are you alleging, is this video alleging that it is impossible to successfully choke an owl? That's, that's what the video said. Again, I'm just giving you the, the data. I'll choke the sh** now. Uh, do well, you? Do... I, I, think, I, think, I think an owl probably can be choked. I mean, it, it certainly has a neck uh, and it certainly is a fragile neck. I mean, you know, so, but whether it can, you know, whether it can defend itself with those talents, and, uh, whether you're gonna be able to do it easily is not the question. It is possible though. I, you, I, I just can't see it not being you possible. You remember when John Cheney threatened to kill John Calipari <laughs> in that press conference? <laughs> I'll yeah. kill you! That was a great moment. Can you guys find the video for that, please? Because it was a great moment, and we can all relive it right now. Uh, incidentally, Tony, every time I look at you, I th I see someone different. Right now, it's 1960s era's Beatles. Yes. <laughs> Kick your ass. The yeah, we'll wig. get that in a second, Mike. Settle down. Uh, uh, Ron, in, in some sad news, I've got some video to play for you here, but it was national news, sad news. A young giraffe at Zoo Miami died from a broken neck after running into a fence. Uh, what what happened there? Because you guys are very careful about how you protect every every you know, animal I there, wish, but the giraffes especially. I, I wish I knew, Dan. Uh, the giraffe was found dead in the morning. First check in the 7 a.m. in the morning had been dead for, for probably several hours because it already rigor had already set into the animal's body. None of the other giraffe that were with that giraffe had any sign of injury or trauma. We didn't see any tracks of any animals like coyotes or bobcats or anything like that or dogs surrounding the area. Um, it's obvious or apparent that something frightened that calf, that, that juvenile that made it run into a fence and break its neck. Um, I, I wish I had an answer to it. You know, there's there's no way to sidestep it. It's a tragedy that happened. We've, we're monitoring the herd all the time now. Uh, I think we're considering putting cameras back there to see if there's something going on that we are not aware of. But again, the fact that none of the other 10 giraffe, um, you know, show any signs of any trauma or any kind of injury, who knows? Maybe it stepped on a scorpion or something, you know, something really freaked it out uh, that individually affected just that animal. Uh, I wish I had an answer, but it was it was certainly a tragic loss. The plural of giraffe is giraffe. Yeah, both giraffes and giraffe. I've heard it both ways. Uh, put it on the poll, please. Juju at Lebetard show plural of giraffes, uh, giraffes or giraffe. Uh, let me play for you from the Fort Worth Zoo here. Elmo the gorilla is released back into his enclosure. You've told us the stories about this happening occasionally at uh, zoos all over. There were two zookeepers already in there. So yeah. what, what happened in this situation and what was going to happen in this situation? What do you do in this situation when the gorilla comes running out and there's still zookeepers in there? Was that gorilla about to do something bad? Uh, no, no. You know, that's that's a big mis misconception. Everybody's like, oh, the gorilla's out to kind of kill these people. No, the gorilla was very upset. There's no question about it. But I'm telling you, the gorilla was also frightened. Um, it's a big male, and he's, he's basically displaying. He's using body language to threaten the people to leave. He does not want to have a physical conflict with those people. And those keepers were smart. They reacted perfectly. They didn't turn their back. They tried to slowly get their way out of the exhibit without causing any kind of panic. But what that gorilla is doing, what gorillas do to other gorillas in the wild, they will use this body language. They make themselves look as big as possible. They make the hair stand up on their arms. They tighten their lips. They arch their backs, and they look very powerful like that. And that's their visual body language saying, get out of here. You do not belong here. But I'm going to tell you right now, that gorilla's heartbeat was at a very accelerated rate. He was probably as frightened or as agitated as those keepers were. Um, that was obviously a human error. Those keepers went in there when they thought the gorilla had been secured, when it had not been secured. By the way, that happened sometime last year. It's just that video just now came out. Um, but I think it proves the point that these animals, do, they want to avoid that physical conflict whenever possible. And he was going through a series of steps, classic of a gorilla, showing this dominance, showing that without actually physically attacking the keepers. And to him, it worked because they eventually left the habitat as soon as they had the opportunity. Case closed. More recently on the National Geographic show Queens, we've got Sophia the Killer Whale, a 60-year-old orca, a grandmother, uh, captured on camera killing a great white shark. How rare is this video? You've told us before about the killer whale. 
uh, being uh, able to do this, but I have not seen it before. So how rare is this footage? Uh, the footage is extremely rare. I don't think the actual incident is rare, though. Um, you know, I know in, in South Africa, I've been to South Africa where I've watched white sharks in the water and then I've gone back when the white sharks have totally evacuated the entire bay because killer whales have taken residence there. And it's really disturbed the South Africans because it's ruined a huge part of their economy. People pay a tremendous amount of money to go out in these shark cages to observe white sharks. And now they've evacuated the bay out there in South Africa because the killer whales are there. So killer whales do effectively kill great white sharks. Uh, they will actually cause great white sharks to evacuate areas. So it's not uncommon that it happens, but it is very uncommon to get it on film. How about this orca uh, doing this to a bottlenose dolphin? It's a short video, but what do you make of this video? Oh, wow. Yeah. An orca um, basically jumps out of the water and gets the dolphin in midair. Don't know what to tell you about that. Again, you know, orcas are predators um, and they are, you know, capable of eating dolphin. I don't know that they do on a regular basis. But they are fish eaters. Uh, of course, dolphins are mammals. I understand that before everybody jumps on my stuff here. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the what the purpose was behind that. I don't know if it was aggression, if it was play. I don't know what it was. But um, great, great video. I mean, incredible video. How about this animal video of an owl trying to attack something that would become a wildcat? Al trying to attack something. That's your cue video to play the John Cheney video. <laughs> for giving them hell down in West Virginia. And here you get a hell of a job right here today. Good job. Three class guys. And you pick them out here and single them out. You can't get any other new to threaten the guys. Shut up, guys. You can't get any other threaten the guys. Hey, hey, hey. Wow. That's, that's hostile. That's, that's very hostile. That's March. Uh, your reaction to that was the same as it was to the orca hitting a bottlenose dolphin in midair. Uh, Ron, good seeing you again, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure, guys. Have a good week. If I see you again, I'm going to kick your ass. Roy, you're usually good at this stuff, uh, rummaging through the Wayback File. Greg Cody's wheezing laugh reminds me of the wheezing laugh of some sort of cartoon character that I'm not able to place which cartoon character it was that laughed like this. Cody's just general late... Uh, Snightly Whiplash's dog. How? Muttley! Muttley! How? Muttley! How? Cody's just How? general How? late... I think he might be right about that. I'm not totally sure, Who? but uh, there there is a laugh in cartoon land <laughs> that sounds like the aged, discrepant laugh of one Greg Cody when he can't quite get the wheeze out correctly, so it's just sort of muffled. Cody's just general late... We'll see if video can track down the laugh I'm talking about. It is Muttley. I've confirmed uh, it. Uh, Roy's good at that. Yeah. He's got it. Was Dick Dastardly, by the way, who was the owner of Muttley the dog. It was a Hannah Barbera cartoon. <laughs> like, <laughs> the Perils of Penelope Pit Stop, I think. Ow. Yeah, would you consider what? him his owner? They kind of were like a duo. Yeah. They were an evil doing duo to just break it down to pet owner dynamics is a little complicated it's, yeah that's it's true. layered it's nuanced yeah absolutely i have a lot of local stuff to get to i'm wondering if mike and roy suffered any sort of post-traumatic stress disorder from losing at home to the tampa bay lightning and watching five goals scored by the lightning which isn't something we've seen happen a whole lot to the panthers this year what an unbelievable game that was over the weekend by the way espn came out with its top 10 active rivalries in the nhl and the panthers made this list twice wow. uh, and the number three overall rivalry was with the tampa bay lightning it was an old school loss to the lightning in that bobrovsky seemed to let everything in early and 88 was just out of his mind what was the final shot total roy uh, in the second and third periods it was 38 to 5 in favor of the panthers unfortunately with those five shots on goal from tampa three of them were allowed in the net by by bob what an unbelievable game what a moment this league is having right now night after night after night 
there seems to be a division leader at a division leader with a lot to play for. And now Ovechkin and his peak male form has gotten the Washington Capitals back into the playoff race. The skill that these guys are playing with right right now, uh, I was locked in. I made it a plan. My, my, my weekend was I'm watching the Lightning play the Panthers and I'm making it home in time to take a gummy and watch the Oilers take on the Avalanche. And Nathan McKinnon's walk-off overtime assist winner that he bounced off his skate to his stick with a pinpoint accuracy to win that game with less than a second left. This sport is intense right now. There is playoff level intensity being played every night. The skill is out of this world. All the teams seem to be good. There are going to be legitimately good teams that are missing the playoffs. This is actually one of the few sports that can afford to expand. Because there are just so many good teams in the league right now. And Nathan McKinnon is going to end up winning the Hart Trophy this season. I mean, if you look at the wild card standings in the Eastern Conference, it's up for grabs. It's between like five teams right now. Uh, between the Lightning, the Capitals, the Red Rings, the Islanders, and the Sabres, it's going to be interesting seeing who's going to get uh, the first and second wild The Panthers' card. schedule specifically is just a great example of what the schedule is like right now in the NHL. They're off for a few days, and then they pick right back up with six games and ten nights. Nashville, New York Rangers, Boston Bruins, the Islanders who are battling for a playoff spot. It is out of this world right now, and I really hope that people give it a chance because there is nothing better than the Stanley Cup playoffs. It is super intense, especially if you're in one of those markets where those teams go on a run. There are so many great you're teams You're saying right basically that someone else this year, the Panthers barely made the playoffs last year and then end up in the Stanley Cup final. You're saying that can happen again, that there are enough good teams that an eight can wipe out a uh, President's Trophy winner. I'm saying a team that would miss the playoffs if you simulate the playoffs. There are a couple of different incarnations where those teams that are OLI probably make a deep run. The sport is that hotly contested right now. It's just... But you can see the lightning getting there, right? Yeah. You, yeah right. Dude, we've seen hot goalies, whether it be Jaguar or 88 back in his day. We've I hate seen, 88. I hate 88. And the thing is, he's been... Te- <laughs> You're he's terrified had, of him. He's, he's been a, terrible all he's had a season. Really bad season by his standards. In fact, the, the Florida Panthers, the last time they played Vasilevsky, put up a tutty on You're him. You're scared of him. You're yeah, so scared. He, he, yeah, he's even during Fun. timeouts like the splits this guy does just when he's like hanging out waiting for the play to start back up he's intimidating yeah didn't help matters that the panthers hit the post like five times yeah. in that mm. game but right. that's one of those games and i know matthew kachuk got hammered for his quotes after the game because <laughs> he's actually getting hit with wow that didn't sound so confident we can hang with these guys was a quote the guy that said in his locker room we're coming back and winning in this building when they were an eight seed playing the one seed boston's getting hit with lack of confidence get out of here with that uh, oddly enough the bruins panthers made this top 10 list of rivalries and i don't feel really? like it's there no it's no. not it's i figured it was carolina for carolina right. for sure yeah. for me i maybe they're doing the thing because bruins panthers was the highest rated uh, nhl game of quite some time that game seven in Boston, I don't feel like there's a rivalry there, but whether it be the Oilers, the Avalanche, the Stars, the Panthers, the Rangers, the Bruins, or you could make maybe make a shout of any of those other teams that are just outside of that get hot. There's so many teams that can win this cup right now. To have an overwhelming favorite to win the President's Trophy, see, which the Panthers are, seems like a misstep. Because right now, I don't think this late into a year, have you seen the favorite be in the plus 650 range? Usually it gets down a little bit lower, but it's a toss-up. I believe that I can stun both Greg Cody and Stugatz by asking them, do you know who the AAU College Hack, uh, Hockey Division Three national champion is? Huh. Either one of you. Do Would either you one expect of you. me to? Yes, I do. Really? Yes. Say it again. What is it? The, the AAU College Hockey Division Three national champion. It's wordy. I would say uh, Rhode Island. I would say New Hampshire. It's the University of Miami. What? Hockey Town, USA. <laughs> They're climbing up to Division Two. I believe Matthew Schneider's kid plays for this team, by the way. Mm. I don't think Rhode, uh, Rhode Island or New Hampshire is in Division Three. Yeah, they would be, be high. That. This is club <laughs> okay. club hockey. You know, they don't have the same kind of funding. This isn't inside the NCAA, but the the Miami hockey program has been good for quite some time, bal- uh, playing some of their games at Kendall Ice Arena and whatnot. Oh, yeah. But yeah, they're, they're they're making a climb. I wanted to circle back around because uh, Cody mentioned this earlier, and I know Mike has been wanting to talk about it. Mike has gotten very close to the University of Miami women's basketball team. 
uh, Mike, and I don't know if I've already betrayed you by saying this on air, but when you get angry at the University of Miami basketball, the men's basketball team, you have accused them of quitting because they just were so terrible in a way that was confusing, right? Because Miller and Wong were important last year, but not that important that the, the Hurricanes would lose all of their games for six weeks at the end of the season and not be competitive, really. But one of the things you guys mentioned is that, yes, the NCAA announced Miami is the number one overall seed for the WBIT and put out pub, uh, you know press release and bracket explaining Miami as the number one team. Uh, Stony Brook announces that they were playing Miami, and then Miami declines the invitation. So James Madison is added and made the number one overall seed after uh, not being in, right? Like... <laughs> Yeah. So you've got a you've got a one seed that wasn't even in the tournament because Miami's just like never mind we're yeah. not going to do this. I haven't spoken to people cuz like this truly came as a shock and I don't pretend to know everything about the women's basketball game. My my focus is pretty singularly focused on the Miami Hurricanes basketball team and what happens inside the ACC, but all the coverage that I consumed throughout the ACC tournament and selection Sunday it was a foregone conclusion that Miami had done enough to get into this tournament. Yeah, is nine teams from one conference a lot? Were they the ninth team? Yes, yes. But most of these people that do this for a living, if not all of them, had Miami in after they won UNC. They didn't after they beat UNC in the tournament. They said that they were in independent of that result. They went into that tournament, get the extra win. They should be safe, getting no reward for making a push to the Elite Eight last year, totally forget, uh, forgotten, and the coverage on Selection Sunday, and I understand why we're here. Caitlin Clark is a megastar, huge drawing power, but it is so focused on the top seeds. You couldn't get a word in edgewise about a two seed, let alone a bubble team. No one was held accountable. They have this 10-minute interview with someone from the committee. Miami is not brought up once in it. And I'm, I'm truly upset by it because everyone that's supposed to be an expert in this field said, for sure, Miami is getting in. And there is zero explanation as to why. It was major disrespect for the program and, and for Katie Meyer after what they did last year. When you reach the Elite Eight, you have to have the benefit of doubt. <laughs> Fight through it. Fight through it. You're almost there. You have to have the benefit of doubt. They weren't even on, a bubble hold team. Hold on, gather yourself and let's just play Muttley laughing. Gather your voice, gather your, your strength. It's like Gregor Muttley. <laughs> Roy, did, you didn't even talk to Roy about that, and he brought it up and knew exactly what cartoon from whatever I know. Era that he was. has. He's, he's, he's a yes. bit of a savant. That's yeah. just general late. Greg, you want to try again? Yeah, I, I don't often get angry at something like this, but I was angry on behalf of, of UM because such a slap in the face. They were disrespected. They make the Elite Eight. They go 19 and 12. They beat then the number four team in the country. They weren't a per they didn't have a perfect season. They were eight and ten against the ACC, two and seven against ranked teams. But still, when you're an Elite Eight team and you go 19 and 12 the next season. <laughs> Last season doesn't count, rank, though. Rank, it, 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 it should. It should, earn, it should earn some it should, respect. It should for in terms of prestige. It, it really should. They it had should. a ranked win at Mississippi State uh, against a good uh, team there. The home win against NC State. I thought we were in a little trouble when NC State got a three seed because I thought they were better than that. Uh, Katie Meyer absolutely maximized the talent on this roster. This right. is a rebuilding year for the Hurricanes. They'll be fine. They have a top 10 class coming in. Katie Meyer and her staff are exceptional at what they do. I'm a little bit more worried about the men uh, because Heavy was a head that uh, wears a crown of the blue blood, and we choked under that pressure. Yeah. And it seemed the men ended the season on a 10-game losing streak. Embarrassing. I think all the accusations that I've had down the stretch that this team might have quit on them, they, they were warranted because that was quitting time. They should have gotten in based on last year. What are you guys talking about? It's not about what you did last year. It's about your resume this year. Like, what are you doing? Okay, okay. He's right. Thank Ob you. Obviously, the Miami men making the Final Four last year doesn't translate when you have a losing record and end with 10 losses in a row. It's not about last year. It's about pedigree. It's, it's, we're it's having two different conversations. For the women, yeah, what you do in recent years does Absol actually matter. And absolutely. It, but it and shouldn't. It, the measurement is I, this year. I understand, right. but it's taken into consideration all the time when you have these blue blood programs on the bubble. It right. is. And, and they weren't even a bubble team. Bracketology had them uh, the nine seed last time I looked. I mean, that's not even close to being a bubble team. Now, Laren Yeager, 
I don't know what his excuse is because when you look at that team, he had a lot of them. Okay, I know, but uh, you follow it closely, more closely. Hold on, than let's I do. hear from Larinaga on this. Let's just okay. hear and then have uh, your wheezing thoughts afterward. A very popular thing to do to put your name in the transfer portal. There are approximately four thousand or a little bit more uh, Division One players. There's going to be two thousand in the portal. That means half the players in college basketball are, are looking for a new destination. Does that make any sense to anybody? It doesn't to me. Because in my mind, a lot of those players that put their name in are actually, are actually saying, I'm giving up on myself. I have to go someplace else because I can't prove myself here. And to a certain degree, that could be true. But on a lot of cases, those kids, as you get older, you get better. You know, my coaches and I talk about it all the time. How many, how many guys have transferred out of here and enjoyed greater success? Either their team won more or they became the star of the team like they envisioned when they left. So you can look at the four that transferred last year and, and tell me what you think. Um, I'm sorry, but they had a healthy team. I think their top seven scorers all played at least 25, 27 games. There's no excuse to end with a 10-game losing streak that turns you from a mid-seed back to defend your Final Four into an embarrassment with a losing record. It's just the way that season ended for them was almost unheard of. I, I, I agree largely with your point. They they had a ton of injuries. They did not have a consistent lineup. I think they had the most starting fives, uh, different starting fives inside their own conference. They had very annoying, nagging injuries that happen all year long. That is an explanation. There there was tons of excuse making, I think, in that post game press conference. A little red flaggy, I think. It, to, anytime you have an aging coach, uh, just get on the pulpit and lament the transfer portal. But this team is actually not that far away, especially if Omir, who can come back, does indeed come back. If Pack comes back, they have one of the most prized recruits in the history of the athletics program, all sports, in Jalil Bethea coming in. He's a number two recruit in the nation presently. Make it bumped up to number one. They're not that far off. And so far, the, uh, the, the people leaving were really kind of part of the problem when you look at on-court performance. If If – the 10-game losing streak is attributed to a team quitting on itself or on its coach. What would be the reason for that? Because 10 losses ago, they were absolutely uh, an NCAA tournament team. I'm confused by a couple of things here. I thought Poplar was going to be a lot better, and I thought that uh, you could offset the Wong-Miller loss by getting Cleveland from FSU. Like, yeah. I really thought that was going to make some kind of difference. Uh, Cleveland was not the defensive fit that Jordan Miller was. Jordan Miller allowed them to do a lot of things defensively. Poplar, I loved him at FSU. Poplar, he developed a hitch in his shot. And we saw early in Poplar's career, he did not trust his shot. Kansas left him wide open, and then he had an unbelievable year, probably built himself into a lottery pick. And now he's at the point in his career where he may have to come back because of the the mental aspects of the game. It, Miami played a really bad brand of basketball. Five guys standing around the perimeter, taking the worst shots or turning the ball over. They played like they quit. This isn't a results thing. If you watch those games, these were horror you shows. Could, you couldn't lose more than 10 times in the 10 times that they played. 